Wow, I feel like I'm under interrogation with these lights. This is good. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, well, there, there's the picture. Um, that was about uh, 35 or 40 pounds ago. Uh, some people might go, oh, my gosh, he's put weight on. And my, you know, my view is, in my old age, I want to remain gravitationally closer to the planet, uh, number one. And number two, out of sympathy for the, my precious Marines who I've missed so long, I decided to put some weight on so that I'd, in sympathy for them, I'd be carrying the same amount of weight that they'd have in their packs on any <laughs> given day. Now, much of what I was planning to say this afternoon has, uh, has been said three times. Um, but it's good. It's good stuff. And I asked Wendy about how we were going to handle uh, the fact that a lot of the things that we've talked about uh, already today in this really terrific session. Uh, and it's, first of all, it's wonderful to be with Amir. It's very difficult to follow Zabe, who's a, a, a great scientist and entrepreneur. Um, but I said to Wendy, how do, you, how do you think we should follow this? And she quickly reminded me that while all day long we've been demonstrating this idea of artificial intelligence, that I was going to be uniquely qualified this afternoon to demonstrate uh, natural ignorance. So uh, we're going to work at this very hard. Now, let me take a couple of minutes and talk about a concept for you. I'm not going to get into the, the individual employment of, of artificial intelligence. There's, for every one of you in here, you probably have 10 great ideas for where a, a military application of artificial intelligence could come from <clears throat> or where it could go. Not just the militarization, but the weaponization as well. But what I want to talk about this afternoon is, is a concept that I think we need to be thinking about today. <clears throat> Many of the speakers here, whether it was about aviation or about policy or about robotics, have talked about our capacity to see into the future. And I think we really do need to see into the future. We need to think seriously about what, what is coming at us in the emerging geostrategic environment of the future, to include the megatrends, and I can touch those in Q&A if you like. But the reality, of course, is I think we're going to be facing a military or a geostrategic environment that will be characterized with the term hyperwar. Hyperwar. Now, for those of you who've been in uniform, I know many of you have. And for those of you who have supported our military, I know many of you have. Uh, what you know is a fundamental truth about conflict, war, and battle. And that is, it is a time competitive process. And all other things being equal, sometimes not even all other things being equal, sometimes fighting outnumbered, sometimes <clears throat> fighting under duress, for that side that can decide and act more quickly than the opposing side, the chances are very good that you'll prevail if it's a strategic conflict or you'll win in battle. War is a time competitive process. And you sometimes heard it called the, it's reduced to the OODA loop in the context of being faster than your opponent. It doesn't necessarily mean being fast, because speed costs energy. What it does mean, though, is that you need to be faster than your opponent in the various things that you seek to achieve. And you've heard this term OODA loop in the John Boyd context. And if you haven't studied John Boyd, who was one of the Air Force's great fighter pilots who theorized this concept of first you observe the environment in which you're operating, and then you orient yourself on that environment, and then you decide, and then you act. OODA loop, O-O-D-A, observe, orient, decide, and act. And what's important about that, the theory goes, if you are able to move more quickly through that loop than your opponent, Eventually what happens is your opponent ceases to be able to compete with you in this time competitive environment. And that's what you want. Theories of war that rely on attrition, killing, and killing people and breaking things, unless it is informed by the, ultimately the human effect, it's, it's not going to be effective. So the point is, as you cycle through your time loop more quickly than your opponent, eventually what happens, we've seen it happen over and over again, I'm going to talk about the history in just a second, is you see the beginnings of something called psychological dislocation, where the opposing commander, commanders, and troops are always behind, always reacting, 
always under pressure. And eventually what you see is collapse. And that's what you're looking for in war. Not an attrition victory. You're looking for the enemy to collapse. And what artificial intelligence does for us in an environment where we're going to see the truly the collapse of the uh, decision action loop or the massive compression of the OODA loop, it gives us an incredible advantage in an environment called hyperwar. So let me just take a second and talk about some of the examples of what I'm talking about here. If you take the time to read Clausewitz, he talks in his theory of war that there is a, an inherent relationship between something called the nature of war and the character of war. And Mike Horowitz, I think, and, and Paul and Christopher talked about it. But it is, it is a dynamic. It is often a tension. The nature of war is the human aspect of the conflict. How well is the human aspect insinuated into the conflict itself? What is the role of the human at the moment? And then the character of war typically is the technological dimension of war. And what Clausewitz would say, and what I think we now know from a long series of historical events, is that when the two are in equilibrium, much can be accomplished. But if they get out of sync, then you're in trouble. Let me just take a second to give you some historic examples. Might seem like a small issue, but it was one that had enormous implications. The advent of the 1861 three-banded 58 caliber rifled musket Springfield in the American Civil War. All other weapons had been smoothbore to that point. Consequently, the tactics of the day, because of a limited range and very limited accuracy, was that you attacked a position shoulder to shoulder in step. But the rifled musket gave us the capacity to, through something called gyroscopic precession to project the round 1,000 meters instead of 200 meters with great accuracy out to 400 to 600 meters. And because it was a different kind of a weapon, it could be loaded and fired by a good infantryman four times a minute. So the accuracy and the volume of fire increased dramatically, but the leadership the nature of the conflict, the leadership never appreciated the impact of that weapon system. And the Americans paid for this on both sides with the hundreds of thousands of dead and wounded on the battlefield because we didn't change our tactics. Another example, latter part of the 19th century, we saw the emergence of railways throughout the Prussian region of Europe. The Prussians were building them to facilitate economic advance and economic development. But what they were really building was a military capacity to move large numbers of troops over strategic distances and sustain them at long range. Never been done before. There had been some limited uh, railroad activity in the American Civil War, but we'd never seen it done at a systematic level and done to achieve strategic outcomes. Consequently, when the, uh, the Franco-Prussian War broke out in the 1870s, and then later, in, as the conflict continued to mature and as states, uh, relations between states continued, the French were completely overwhelmed by the rapidity, speed, and capacity of the German and Prussian forces to concentrate at a particular level. Concentrate and move strategically, operate, uh, conduct operations, and then fight uh, tactically with superior tactics and weapons. This was an example of where, on the German side, the nature of war and the character of war had remained in equilibrium, and the two were complementary. Very important. The next one we saw was in World War I, the advent of the rapid-firing small-caliber weapon would become known as the Maxim machine gun. And in conjunction with heavy artillery, for all intents and purposes, the front of the Western Front from roughly the North Sea to the Swiss border settled down to a series of trenches, and we lost the capacity to maneuver. Whole armies were hurled against these strong points of machine guns and heavy artillery because the leadership could not imagine a technological capacity to break through these lines. And yes, there were limited successes. But at what cost? Because the human, the nature of war, and the technical dimension of the character of war was out of sync. And if you want to know how bad this was, 
the first day of the Somme, the British assault on the German positions at the Somme on the first day of the war, the first day of that battle. 60,000 British killed in action on the first day because of an absence of imagination by the commanders. And it only broke open, ladies and gentlemen, because imaginative young officers teamed with engineers to produce a mobile armored vehicle called the tank. And while the traditional army leaders thought that the tank was in fact heretical and had no place on the battlefield, it was very clear to the innovators and the imaginators, those leaders with vision, that the tank was the key to success in breaking open the stalemate of the Western Front, and in fact, that would happen. Fast forward a bit. We have British leaders writing extensively about the use of maneuver facilitated by armored columns and armored capabilities in conjunction with rapidly moving artillery. Revolutionary effect. But the British government failed to resource it. Basically, the tank corps went out of business after the First World War. But a German communicator saw something very clearly. He saw what the tank had done to the Western Front. But he was a communicator. He was a pioneer in wireless communications. And he recognized that by linking up wireless communications on top of armored formations, and then creating the capacity for the Ju-87 Delta Stuka, which was a dive bomber with incredible accuracy, integrating air and ground maneuver with wireless communications, it created a capability that we had never seen before on, in warfare. It became known as the Blitzkrieg. And for those of you who studied the full integration of this capability, what happened was the Germans were able to operate at speeds heretofore unthinkable. And as they broke through against the British and the French at the beginning of World War II, and if you've seen Dunkirk, you know what the outcome there was, something very interesting happened to the French leadership. They were isolated from their troops in dugouts and headquarters well to the rear. And as the Germans broke through the French positions, they cut all the phone lines, isolating them even more. In essence, in that era, a massive cyber attack. It cut the communications, left the forward troops isolated, while the general officers back in their headquarters were completely isolated from the battle. They didn't know what was happening, and what we suddenly found is every time they got a report, there was German armor deeper in the French rear, and psychological dislocation set in because of the speed of the conflict. Fast forward a little further. The British needed to take out the Italian Navy the Battle of Toronto at the very beginning of World War II. And off their carrier, they sent a very rudimentary airplane called the Kingfisher. It was a, bi a biplane that carried torpedoes. And they did. They attacked the, the Italian Navy at Toronto and basically took it out using naval aviations from naval platforms with a, with a maritime torpedo. Now, the United States, as I think Mike Horowitz said, we were in this this incredible debate in the Navy, the battleship sailors versus what was emerging as the naval aviation component. Hell of a battle in this, over this issue. It was a doctrinal issue because if the one side won, we built more battleships. If the other side won, we built more aircraft carriers and airplanes. And a whole segment of the Navy was going to be marginalized and a new segment of the Navy was going to be empowered. Huge implications at a societal level. Well. There was a group of people that didn't miss the, the significance of the Battle of Toronto and the significance of naval aviation, and that was the Japanese. And when the Japanese attacked us on the 7th of December, 1941, they put the American battleship row on the bottom of Pearl Harbor, and thank God both of our carriers, our two carriers, happened to be at sea that day on an exercise because they sailed into port shortly after the final Japanese attack to discover that the, the, the battleship row of the Pacific Fleet was on the bottom of Pearl Harbor. We were out of sync. The nature of war and the character of war had gotten out of sync. So the question for us today, we have to step back from the environment in which we find ourselves. We have to look at this emerging technology which is at hand. AI is no longer theoretical. 
AI is no longer solely in the laboratories. AI is being implemented today. And the question we need to ask ourselves today is, is the nature of war, us, and our appreciation of technology in sync or in equilibrium with where artificial intelligence can take us in conflict, in war, and in battle? And I would contend that while we're thinking about it more, we are a long way away from a comprehensive doctrinal approach to this. And I worry about that because there are other forces at work on the planet that are both thinking about the nature of war and the character of war and the difference between us and them. Because we'll figure this out. We're actually pretty smart about this sort of thing, although we're often late to the game. One of the reasons we've been able to win over the years late to the game was because we would put unlimited resources into it. America doesn't like to fight fair. It's not in our ethos. We're going to gang up on you. We're going to knock you down. We're going to step all over you. But if you're already behind and the nature of war does not appreciate where we are technologically and we haven't invested in the technology in the context of integrating it into our war fighting capabilities, <clears throat> then, ladies and gentlemen, we may have strategic surprise in our future. What I don't want to be is a part of an organization that has strategic surprise in the future. So I'll just say this. It's important that we are constantly innovating. Everyone in this room, you're innovators. You're part of the future. That's what this, uh, this conference is all about. But I would also tell you, as Heinz Guderian learned in the interwar years between World War I and World War II, certain technologies and capabilities exist today which with an imaginative individual involved, with innovative scientists, we can be integrating that today to prevent strategic surprise. And let me just talk a little bit about that from my own experience. Um, I commanded the, uh, the war effort in Afghanistan from uh, July of 2011 to uh, February of 2013. And as I think back upon the challenges that I had in leading a theater of war, all of Afghanistan, 150,000 troops, when I think back upon the challenges of leading that operation, and I know now what artificial intelligence can do in the context of providing me information in a timely and highly accurate scaled manner for the purposes of my decision making, I thirst after that capability. One of the first things we have to deal with as we think about artificial intelligence in a militarized or weaponized view, militarized in the context of what a strategic commander needs, is the issue of data. Data. I think uh, Paul talked about data as the new oil, the black gold, so to speak. And, and ladies and gentlemen, it is. Because the effectiveness of artificial intelligence actually relies on the data that you have. And so recently I was asked by some folks who were studying how artificial intelligence can enhance commanders' capabilities. I was asked, how would you begin to think about integrating artificial intelligence as a, as a strategic commander? And I, my first question was, help me to understand how you've defined the data. Because if you don't start there with a very clear definition of what data is available, then you're not necessarily going to be able to understand what algorithms can help you or those algorithms, once employed, will be sub-optimized. So one of the very first and most important aspects of our capacity to uh, understand the employment of artificial intelligence is what is our data source? How will we define that data source? How will we make that data available to us? And then the second really important thing is how are we going to compute the data? As super com computation, as supercomputers become more uh, prolific and more numerous, we've got greater capabilities farther forward to ingest huge amounts of data, scale it, and then apply the algorithms to it ultimately for the purposes of decision making. <clears throat> and, and frankly, while I don't fully understand the concept yet, I think Amir probably does and others in the room, Zabe does, the whole potential dimension of quantum computing for the reduction of nearly unlimited amounts of data in speeds that we cannot imagine can provide commanders information, timely, accurate information 
on almost a near real-time basis to make strategic decisions. So the data, the computing, and then the algorithms. And as a commander, I'd be very interested in that. As a strategic commander, one of the greatest things that this could have done for me would have been to, my term, sense the operational and strategic environment. Sense the environment, which means see it, hear it, feel it. And with comprehensive access to data and improved cap capabilities that we now have in terms of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, our ISR, my capacity to understand what the enemy was doing in almost any quarter of Afghanistan could have been massively improved. Not perfect, not perfect, but could have been massively improved, which would have given me the capabilities to shape the strategic environment based on my own resources while I worked closely with my core commander, a fellow who you may know by the name of Scaparotti was one of them, and James Terry was another, two of the finest soldiers I've ever known. I could have helped to shape their operational environment, the first level down below strategic, so that they could attack the enemy throughout the depth of their operational environment while I was attacking the enemy throughout the strategic environment. And then down lower at the tactical level where we have brigades and lower echelon forces, they would be dealing with the enemy at the point of impact, where the, the very important information for decision support was helping me to shape the operational, the strategic environment, the core commander shaping the operational environment. Now the kids at the point of impact are going to have to deal with the reality of the enemy at the end of the bayonet. And here is where semi-autonomous and autonomous systems are going to be very important to us. And I'm not talking about the Taliban now. I'm talking about the potential for a near-peer or peer competitor who has invested huge amounts of money in autonomous systems. And at a tactical level or at an operational level, you're dealing with swarm after swarm after swarm of intelligent systems that not only have been trained to locate your position on the ground by virtue of the entire nature of your electromagnetic uh, signature. But some of these systems are coming in with facial recognition capabilities. They're coming in recognizing where there are flaws and weaknesses in your defenses. They're coming in capable, ultimately, of jamming your cyber capabilities. And worst of all, they're all cooperating with each other. It's something that we need to be able to do, and it's something that I know the enemy is seeking to do. So there is enormous capacity for artificial intelligence to support the strategic commander, the operational commander, and the tactical commander. We need to think this through. We need to, think our, we need to look in the mirror and think very seriously to ourselves, are we, in fact, in balance? Have we achieved the, the equilibrium between the nature of war and the character of war? And we've got to be honest with ourselves. You know, within the Department of Defense, I think our secretary apart from the fact he's a very close friend and I have boundless respect for Jim Mattis, I think he's doing all that he can right now. You know, we have DARPA, we have the Strategic Capabilities Office, we have the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, and all of them are working overtime to try to find the right combinations of capabilities that can harvest the big data, ultimately apply the algorithms to give us an artificial intelligence capability across the spectrum of warfare. But the truth is, if we can't win the time competitive nature of the decision action loop, and we're fighting in a hyper war environment, this issue of dislocation comes on pretty quickly, folks. And I'll simply tell you, um, having been involved in a couple places like Ramadi and, and Fallujah, where the cycle of battle was very fast, and attrition was occurring all around you, and there was a, there was a lot of, of uh, distractors the capacity of artificial intelligence to provide commanders with very important near real-time information to make tactical decisions or to employ autonomous or semi-autonomous systems is very important to us. Now, that's, that's AI in the, in the strategic, operational, tactical perspective. But there are also many functional dimensions of artificial intelligence, which I know we should be exploring on a regular basis, and I think we are. I think Christopher talked about wearables. Imagine a commander being able to know at any given moment where his troops are. We have some capability today in that. But also to know 
what the health status is of every single person in that unit. Body temperature, heart rate, breathing, blood pressure, some other capabilities that we may want to understand. And as you go forward into battle, as you begin to take casualties, you know immediately several things. You know where that person is down and wounded. You know the nature of the wound. You know then how, because you've got an artificial intelligence platform helping you to understand what the totality of the battle casualties are and what the needs will be for medical support, you're already using autonomous decision-making, beginning to pre-position the kinds of medical support necessary to reduce the, the effect of the casualty. There's enormous capacity there, as well as supply chain discipline. You get yourself into a big firefight, or you're in a maneuver battle with, with heavy armored units, you go through fuel and you go through heavy uh, ordnance and you go through small arm ammunition very quickly. Plus you go through water and you go through food very quickly, but that's the last op, uh, item. But if you've got constant monitoring of the supply levels of ammunition and fuel and other sustainment capabilities, and it's being monitored in near real time, the logisticians can be given near real time or real time information on how best to manage the logistics in the battlefield, ultimately to maintain the momentum of the, of the attack. Because if you can maintain the momentum of the fight and keep the, the pressure on the enemy, you'll begin to create strategic and psychological dislocation, which is exactly what you want to do. So this should all be supporting that. And then finally, you know, we've hit this a couple of times today, this issue of autonomous killing. You know, we've talked about automation in the system. What we haven't talked about all that much is uh, the, an autonomous decision-making capability in the system, which I can foresee, but also autonomous weapon systems operating uh, on their own in the battle space. Uh, look, we've got a moral dilemma here. We are Americans. We are a nation of laws. We are a nation that respects human rights. And we're willing to shed our own blood on behalf of other people around the world on their behalf and give our lives for them, which is the nature of who we are. So taking life incorrectly or taking life uh, improperly as a result of the use of aut uh, autonomous systems, killing systems, is anathema to us. And we're going to have to have the question and the comment or the uh, considerations on how we deal with this ethically. And I would propose to you that we do need to think about this. We can't leave this in the future. We have got to be thinking about it now. We've got to get this right because from this then comes the kinds of research necessary that would help us to have autonomous systems. Look, I, I'm going to tell you if, you, if you were to look at the pictures of Fallujah or look at the pictures of Ramadi or look at the pictures of any city that we've had to fight in, and in particular, and this was my last war, the Islamic State, look at Mosul today. There were 1.7 million people in that city and we've rubbled it because we used heavy firepower to get at the enemy. I would contend that in a certain environment, through facial recognition, through hyperspectral recognition of certain kinds of uniforms, through computer or machine vision, using those kinds of systems in a built-up area where, because the system has been trained on facial recognition and other capabilities, we are able to get target identification quickly, the system is able to establish positive identification of the target. The system then applies the collateral damage estimate, which may at that particular moment be zero, which means if there's a, a woman or a child or an innocent somewhere near that target where the effects of the blast of the pick the weapon might kill, might cause innocent casualties, then the system is going to pull off. It's not going to engage. But if we if because of the nature of the battle, we've changed our collateral damage estimate to some higher number, then that system gets target identification, gets positive identification, it's a fleeting target, he takes the shot. And the chances are very good that there'll be far fewer civilian casualties and far less collateral damage when those systems are used properly. So how do we get the ethical piece into this? Where do we get the human in the loop? There was a description earlier today about the kinds of returns that are coming back to headquarters that might give us time to punch the button that gives it weapons free status to engage the target. We may find ourselves in such a swirling high intensity battle 
that we no longer can do that. The human is a, is a break on the, the success of the battle. We turn the whole thing over to the autonomous systems. The way we do this is not to disregard the law of armed conflict. Three components of the law of armed conflict. First, that force is necessary. Second, that you can discriminate in the use of force so you do not intentionally create civilian casualties or unnecessary collateral damage. And third, that the force is proportionate. Those are the three rules that all commanders have to live by. I can tell you right off the top of my head, I get the calls in the middle of the night from places around the world, tell us about your role as a commander using the law of armed conflict. We have to build that into the algorithm so that we don't insert the human in the middle of a swirling battle where there's autonomous systems at work and we slow ourselves down by building this into the algorithm and training that algorithm rigidly. On, when given weapons-free status, we have the necessity to engage. We have the ability to discriminate between non-combatants and collateral damage of uh, key infrastructure, and that the weapon system coming off the wing is going to be proportionate to your needs. So you don't use a 2,000-pound bomb when a dialable warhead on a Hellfire missile will give you a very small return. And you put the round through the, through the second story of someone's building, and you take the guy out, and you haven't demolished the building, and nobody else inside the building is armed. We have that capability. Are we integrating it yet? Have we taken full advantage of the imagination yet? That's the question that we have, I think. So we shouldn't be afraid of the conversation about autonomous killing. But we have to be realistic about what it means and what limits <coughs> and, and what measures we as a nation of laws and a people for whom human rights are very important, what measures can we put into the algorithm and the training of the algorithm ultimately to reduce to the maximum extent possible the potential for collateral damage. And I will simply tell you, we've had very senior American officials say no autonomous killing systems, only to have the next day the most sophisticated autonomous system on the planet, an, an American pilot, drop a 2,000 pound bomb on friendlies. And we've got to have perspective here. And I would much rather have had autonomous systems inside Fallujah or Ramadi pinpoint targeting certain key uh, 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 entities than the, the kind of heavy artillery that we ultimately had to use in order to make uh, our success. We're going to have to think about that. And then one couple, couple final points. What I worry about today is as the U.S. moves off considering the relationship between the nature of war and the character of war. As the U.S. moves forward, embracing artificial intelligence and big data for the purposes of creating the capacity for us to fight a hyper-war environment and not have to fight because it's inflicted on us, but to be prepared to inflict it on our opponents. This is, not, this is where we don't fight fair. We're going to move faster than he does. We're going to think faster than he does. We're going to make decisions faster. We're going to employ our weapons more quickly. We're going to recock and do it again. Artificial intelligence has the capacity to do that for us. Here's my worry. We're one of the only nations on the planet, apart from a couple of peer competitors, the Russians and the Chinese, who have the capacity to do all that simultaneously. And my, my worry is that our allies, in particular our European allies, may not, in fact, invest in the kinds of technologies and in the kinds of systems so they can remain integrated with the high technology capabilities of the United States. I led 50 nations on the battlefield in Afghanistan, and I will tell you, there was a US technological capability of the United States Army, which is eye-watering to me. And then there was everybody else, and even our closest allies were not close. Yet we have to achieve interoperability within our alliance system. And as the technological gap increases and increases, as we become more capable of waging hyperwar because of our capacity to ingest and compute big data and scale it with algorithms to give us the capacity to move faster than we've ever seen before, I worry about this gap opening. And if we lose interoperability, it has a direct effect eventually on political cohesion. It's something we need to be thinking about. And then a final point. Nature of war, the human dimension. If we're, preparing, if we're prepared to and preparing to fight in a hyper-war environment, we need to think about what we do to prepare our young officers and our leaders to ex exist in that environment themselves. It may mean we have to change some of the way we think about who we select, what their backgrounds are, 
But importantly, we need to be educating these young officers for an environment where time is of the essence, where decisions will need to be made in seconds or less, time that we've never seen before. So we want to, we want to recruit young women and men to be the officers of our services who have a bias for decision making and who can be trained and educated ultimately to be recognition primed or intuitive decision makers. Because if the technology is going to give you the capacity to fight at a hyperwar environment, then the nature of war, the humans involved in fighting, have got to intellectually and tactically and operationally be emotionally capable of doing it as well. That will, that will permit us ultimately to keep in equilibrium. What Clausewitz said is the recipe for success, and that is when the nature of war is in sync and in equilibrium with the character of war. So I, I'll stop here. I think we'll go to a uh, panel, and uh, I want to thank you for your time and your attention, and it's been an honor to be with you today. Thanks very much. <laughs>